Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's Abdul Rahim Green, and you're joining me for the proof that Islam is the truth. And today, we're going to be dealing with a really, truly fascinating subject, the witnessing of the people of the book. Now, I'm going to be reading a couple of long stories over these episodes, so um, I hope I make it interesting for you, and I'm going to be interjecting it also with some references from the Bible and the Qur'an to show how the people of the book, the Jews and Christians from amongst their scholars and leaders and kings recognize that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was what he claimed to be, the final messenger from Allah. Now, I'm going to start with a famous story that has been collected by Imam Bukhari and his Sahih. And we talked in one of the very earliest episodes about the authentic nature of the verified hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's blessings be upon him. And this hadith or this saying is taken from one of the most authentic collections after of uh, teachings in Islam after the Quran, uh, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari. Um, and it's telling about how when the Prophet Muhammad at a certain time in his messengership in the Medina sent letters to various rulers and dignitaries throughout the world at the time including the Persian Roman Emperor, for example, the Pope in Rome, Nagus of Abyssinia, Macolchus, the leader of the Copts in Egypt. And one of these letters reached Heraclius. Heraclius was the Roman Emperor at the time. And when Heraclius received this letter, he called for his translator. And he gathered together some of the Arabs who were there at the time, and one of them happened to be Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was a cousin of the Prophet, and he was the leader of Mecca, and the leader, in a sense, in fact, of the opposition to the Prophet Muhammad and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad in Arabia. He was therefore the leader of the pagans at the time, and he happened to be in Jerusalem when Heraclius received this letter. So I'm going to read to you that story. He called for his translator who, translating Heraclius's question, said to them, Who amongst you is closely related to that man who claims to be a prophet? And Abu Sufyan replied, I am the nearest relative to him. And Heraclius said, Bring him close to me and make his companions stand behind him. Heraclius told his translator to tell Abu Sufyan's companions, that he wanted to put some questions to me regarding that man and that if I told a lie they should contradict me. By the way, it's Abu Sufyan who is actually telling this story because at a later stage Abu Sufyan himself of course became Muslim. So he's telling this story in fact to Abdullah ibn Abbas who was an early companion of the Prophet Muhammad may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and he's telling him this story and Abdullah ibn Abbas records it. So there we are, there we're in the court of Heraclius, and Heraclius is saying, okay, you, your companions stand behind you, and if he tells a lie, you must tell me that he's lying. Now Abu Sufyan said, by Allah, had I not been afraid that my companions were going to label me a liar, I would have not have spoken the truth about the Prophet. So the first question Heraclius asked, asked Abu Sufyan was this, what family status has he amongst you? And I replied, Abu Sufyan replied, he belongs to a noble family amongst us. Then Heraclius asked, has anybody else amongst you ever claimed the same before him? I replied, no. Was any amongst his ancestors a king? Heraclius asked. Again, Abu Sufyan replied, no. Heraclius asked, do the nobles or the poor follow him? Abu Sufyan replied, it is the poor who follow him. And then the Heraclius asked, are his followers increasing or decreasing? Abu Sufyan replied, they are increasing. Then he asked, does anybody amongst those who embrace his religion become displeased and renounce the religion afterwards? Abu Sufyan replied, no. Heraclius then said, have you ever accused him of telling lies before his claim? Again, Abu Sufyan says no. Heraclius says, does he break his truce 
Abu Sufyan replied, no. We are at truce with him now, and we don't know what he's going to do in it. And Abu Sufyan said, I could not find opportunity to say anything against the Prophet except that time. Then Heraclius asked, have you ever had a war with him? And he, Abu Sufyan said, yes. What was the outcome of the battles? Well, sometimes we were victorious and sometimes he was victorious. And then Heraclius asked, what does he order you to do? And Abu Sufyan replied, he tells us to worship Allah and Allah alone and not to worship anything along with him and to renounce all that our ancestors had said. He orders us to pray, to speak the truth, to be chaste and to keep good relations with our kith and kin. Heraclius asked the translator to convey the following. I asked you about his family and your reply was that he belonged to a very noble family. In fact, all the prophets come from noble families amongst their respective peoples. I questioned you whether anybody else among you claimed such a thing, and your reply was in the negative. If the answer had been in the affirmative, I would have suspected this man was following the previous man's statement. Meaning, if the prophet, if there had been someone before him saying he was a prophet, then the Prophet Muhammad might have just been imitating what that other guy was saying, but no one amongst them had ever said that before. Then I asked you whether any of his ancestors was a king, and you said no. If you had said yes, I would have thought that this man was trying to take back his kingdom. In other words, use the mantle of prophethood to try and take back the kingdom. Then I asked you if he was ever accused of telling lies before this, before his claim to prophethood, and you said no. And then I wondered, how can a person who never lies to people lie about Allah? How could a person who never lies to people lie about Allah? And then I asked you whether the rich people or the poor people follow him, and you said that the poor people follow him. And so it is with all the prophets. They have always been followed by that type of people. The prophets are always followed by the poor and the weak and the oppressed. Then I asked you whether his followers were increasing or decreasing. You said they were increasing, and that is the way of true faith until it is complete in all respects. I further asked you if there was anybody who, after embracing his religion, became displeased and discarded his religion, and you said no. In fact, this is the sign of true faith when its delight enters the heart and mixes with them completely. I asked you whether he had ever betrayed. You said no. And so the prophets never betray. I asked you what he ordered you to do, and you told me that he ordered you to worship Allah and Allah alone, and not to worship anything else along with him, and forbade you from worshiping idols, and told you to pray and to speak the truth, and not commit illegal fornication. If what you said is true, he will very soon occupy this place underneath my feet. And I knew it from the scriptures that he was going to appear. But I did not know that he would be from you. And if I could reach him definitely, I would go immediately to meet him. And if I was with him, I would wash his feet. Heraclius then asked for the letter of the prophet, which was delivered by Dia to the governor of Bura, and then it was forwarded to Heraclius to read. And this is what the letter said. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, from Muhammad, the slave of God and his messenger, to Heraclius, the ruler of the Byzantines. Peace be upon him who follows the right path. Furthermore, I invite you to Islam. And if you become a Muslim, you will be safe. And Allah will double your rewards. And if you reject this invitation, you will be committing a sin by misguiding your peasants. O people of the scripture, come to a word common between you and us that we worship none but Allah and that we associate nothing in worship with him and that none of us should take lords besides Allah. Then, 
if they turn away, say, bear witness that we are Muslims. This is, of course, the translation of a verse of the Qur'an. And Abu Sufyan added, when Heraclius had finished his speech and had read the letter, there was a great hue and cry in the royal court, and we were turned out of the court. I said to my companions, surely the issue of Ibn Abi Kabsha, and that was a type of derogatory term they used, a nickname they used for the Prophet His affair has become so prominent that even the king of the Byzantines is afraid of him. And then I started to become sure that he would be the conqueror in the near future until I embraced Islam. Now this is really a truly remarkable story for two reasons. First of all, as we mentioned, and that's the topic that we're dealing with, how Heraclius knew that there was a prophet still to come. From where did he know this? How did he know this? We're going to talk about that later. There are some things in the Gospels that indicate that a prophet is going to come after Jesus. And we're going to see from the Bible how that prophet is almost certainly the prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him. The second thing that is really amazing about that story is how Heraclius, this wise and intelligent Roman emperor, analyzed the life of the prophet. Are certain questions to be sure in his mind, was he a fake or was he truthful? Did he have the characteristics of a person who was truly a prophet of God or was he someone who could be not what he claimed to be? And he found that on every single count, indeed, the prophet Muhammad matched the descriptions and the attributes of how a prophet should be. We're going to be talking about some more people from the people of the book who witnessed the truth of Muhammad's prophethood after the break. Don't go away. Join us for more of the proof that Islam is the truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of you and may he guide all of us closer to the right path. Um, today we're talking about the witnessing of the people of the book. Some truly remarkable stories from the Jews and the Christians, those people who lived in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, who were expecting the arrival of a prophet. And indeed, Heraclius, the Roman emperor himself, or the emperor rather of the Byzantines himself, uh, recognized that he was expecting a prophet. He did not know, however, that this prophet was going to be from the Arabs, but he recognized the description of the prophethood and the attributes and the qualities of prophethood when he questioned Abu Sufyan, who was the cousin of the prophet, and in fact was the leader of the opposition to the prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him at the time. But I'd like to move back a little bit earlier, into an earlier time in the life of the prophet, and let's talk about another great ruler at the time, and his name was Nagus, and he was the, in fact, the king of Abyssinia. Now it so happened that in the early days in Mecca, the Muslims were suffering a huge amount of oppression. In fact, the pagan Meccans were really persecuting the Muslims terribly. A lot of them, of course, were very poor people, and many of them were even slaves and women, and they were the people in society that nobody really cared if you attacked them or beat them or even killed them. In fact, some of the Muslims had even been killed due to torture and terrible things by the leaders of Mecca. And things became so bad that they decided they had to leave. So the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, he told his followers to go to Abyssinia and he said, there is a king who will never do you injustice. So anyway, they migrated to Abyssinia. Now it happened that the Quraysh had very good relationships with uh, the Abyssinians and uh, knew personally the king of Abyssinia and they sent a delegation, their object was to try and retrieve the Meccans who had escaped and bring them back with them. So the Quraysh went to the king, of, they sent a delegation and they went to the king and they complained to the king that we have these fugitives, they have escaped their country, they've been insulting the religion of our ancestors and kept on telling him stories and so on and so forth. So anyway, Nagus uh, ordered the emigrants who had come to his country to his court and he asked them, about their religion. 
and what was this claim. And um, Jafar ibn Abu Talib, who was the, uh, the leader of the Muslims in, in Abyssinia, gave this very beautiful little speech. And this is how he explained their condition to the king. He said, O king, we were an ignorant people, worshipping idols, eating carrion, and indulging in sexual pleasures. We ridiculed our neighbors. A brother oppressed his brother, and the strong devoured the weak. At this time, a man rose amongst us, who had already been known to be truthful, noble, and honest. This man called us to Islam, and he taught us to give up worshipping stones, to speak the truth, to refrain from bloodshed and not to defraud the orphans of their property. He taught us to provide comfort to our neighbors and not to bring slander against chaste women. He enjoined on us to offer the prayers, observe fasts and give charity. We followed him, gave up polytheism and idolatry and refrain from all evil deeds. It is for this new way that our people have become hostile to us and compel us to return to our old misguided life. Now when the king of Abyssinia heard that, he said that there is no way that I will return these people to you. There is nothing that they have done wrong and they are free to stay and live in my kingdom. So anyway, the Muslims left thinking that was at the end of it. But no, the delegation of Quraysh were not going to give up so easily. One of them thought to himself, I know, let's tell Nagus what they say about Jesus. So they went to Nagus and they said, and he said to him, you know the Muslims, they don't say that Jesus is God or the son of God. They say he's only a prophet of God. Ask them what they believe about Jesus and you will see they even insult your own religion. Anyway, Nagus called them back to the court the other day. And Jafar ibn Abu Talib, he was very worried. He didn't really know what to say. But he determined to speak the truth and to tell him exactly what was in the Qur'an. So Nagus asked him, what do you say about Jesus? So Jafar said, we say what our Prophet says. That he is a messenger from Allah and his word which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit from him. So this is what we believe concerning Jesus, and that he was given the Injil. And when Nagus heard that, he said, truly, Jesus said nothing more than that about himself. What is this book that you read? Nagus asked. And Jafar ibn Abu Talib, he read, the first few verses of Surah Al-Maryam, which are very, very beautiful verses talking about Jesus. And when he read these verses, Nagus began to cry, and so did all, many of the assembled courtiers, even the bishops, they began to cry because of these beautiful words about Jesus in the Qur'an. And then Nagus said, Verily, what your prophet has brought and what Jesus said are two things from the same source. You are free to stay and live in my kingdom. In fact, this same Nagus of Abyssinia himself converted to Islam. He most certainly recognized the truth that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, was a prophet of God. There was in Arabia one Christian. There were not many Christians at all in pagan Arabia, but there was one and his name was Waraka. And he was a very distant cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. In fact, he was more closely related to Khadija, who was the first wife of the Prophet. And for many, many years, of course, his only wife. And when the Prophet Muhammad first received the first verses of the Qur'an, he came down terrified, running. He, he did not know what this experience was. It was a frightening experience to him. And he came running to his wife. And his wife suggested Khadija that they should go and visit Waraka and see what he had to say about this. Now Waraka, when he heard about what the Prophet ﷺ had experienced, he said that this is the Holy Spirit, this is the angel Gabriel. The spirit that comes with the revelation 
that has been sent to you. And then he went on to say, Surely by him in whose hand is Waraka's soul, if you are the prophet of these people, and there has come to you the greatest angel who came to Moses, you will be called a liar, and they will use you despitefully and cast you out and fight you. So this is what Waraka said. And he said, By Allah, if Allah gives me life, I will most certainly follow you. In fact, Waraka died very soon after that. But we also want to talk about the Jewish community. There was a Jewish community, quite a large Jewish community, that lived in Arabia. And some of those people had specifically emigrated because they were expecting in Arabia the coming of the last prophet. In fact, out of the rabbis of Medina, half of them actually became Muslim. And one of the very famous and most learned of the rabbis of Medina was Abdullah ibn Salam. In fact, he said concerning the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, we knew your name and we knew the time and the place of your coming. And he accepted Islam. In fact, when he accepted Islam, he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah, the Jews are a very tricky people. So let us test them before we announce my embracing Islam. So what he did is he gathered all the Jews and he got the Prophet Muhammad to talk to them. And the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, asked the Jews, he said to them, what would you say if Abdullah ibn Salam became Muslim? They said, may Allah protect us from that, he will never become Muslim. He said, well, what do you think of him? He said, he's the best of us and the most knowledgeable person amongst us and he is the wisest amongst us, he would never become Muslim. And again the Prophet said, what would you say if he became Muslim? They said, no, he will never become Muslim, may Allah protect us from that. And when they said that the third time, then Abdullah ibn Salam stepped out from where he was hiding. He said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. And when he said that, then the Jews started saying, he is the most ignorant amongst us, and he is the worst amongst us, and he is the least one to... Uh, know anything amongst us, so they completely changed their tune once he had become Muslim. But Abdullah ibn Salam was one of the very famous Jews and the Jewish rabbis who converted to Islam in the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he recognized that Muhammad was the person that had been foretold in his scriptures. We're going to have some more fantastic stories and amazing histories of those people of the book who converted to Islam based on their knowledge of the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad in the Bible, and we're going to be detailing some of those in our next episode. So don't forget to join us for the proof that Islam is the truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.